We are in a series called Rock Solid, and I can't believe that we're up to week nine. And we've been nine weeks working our way through um, the book of Romans. We're not going to get all the way through. Um, In fact, this series will finish in a couple of weeks' time. Week 11 will be our last one for this part of Romans, but then we'll head into, uh, goodness me, Christmas. Uh, We'll be looking at Christmas series coming up in just a couple of weeks. But we're in week nine of Rock Solid, where we're looking at what it takes for us to have a faith that is so rock solid that no matter what throws against us, what things happen in our world, no matter what things come against us individually, that we'll be able to stand firm on the Word of God and know that we are okay. Not just okay, we are more than okay. And that's what this solid, this series of Rock Solid is all about. It's Romans deals with a, a generation of people or a group of people, Paul's writing to the church in Rome, who was under the governance of Nero, who was very to say the least, anti-Christian, very much anti the church. He, he He delighted in seeing those who professed Christianity, to he, he delighted in seeing them suffer. They were burned at the stake, they were persecuted, they were thrown into prisons. He ran amok with, Christ, when, with Christian faith people. And yet, back in Romans 1, we read, the words of Paul, who's writing to this this people in Rome, saying, the whole world's talking about your faith. How do they do that? How, How was it that they were able to be so confident of their faith in God under the threat of, of death and other persecution? And yet, and so that there should be some lessons in that for us because realistically, we, we're not under the threat of death yet. But, you know, it's not nice when people say bad things about you or me. It's not nice when people ridicule you and because of your stance in, in Jesus Christ. It's not nice when you don't get that promotion at work because of your faith in Jesus Christ. It's not nice when you're not able to gain all the same benefits of, of culture and those sorts of things because of your faith in Jesus Christ. And yet those things are beginning to infiltrate us. Those things that we're being told how we should conform to the patterns of this world. But we're told in Romans, uh, we're not going to get to Romans 12, but Romans 12 says, says to do not conform to the patterns of this world, but let God transform us into a new way of thinking. And that's what we've got to come to. We've got to understand that while we live in the world, when we can't become part of the world, we, we, we live in here for a reason. And so this book of Romans is, is a lesson for us. It helps us to understand how we, just as they were able to, to have this strong faith in, in Jesus Christ, despite what is happening across our nation and across in our own little communities. We're living in this world that's, that's actually diametrically opposed to a life of faith. They're, we're living in a culture that is very anti-Jesus Christ. In fact, you can use almost any other name except Jesus Christ and not, no one will worry. But as soon as you mention Jesus Christ, we are ostracised. In fact, we become foreigners almost in a world where we've, we've grown up, where we've been born in. And, and Peter talks about that in First Peter. He says, dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners. In some translations, it says as aliens. Why does he say that? He says as temporary residents and foreigners that we need to keep away from the worldly desires and that wage war against our very soul. Why are we 
temporary residents and foreigners because when we give our life to the Lord Jesus Christ, we become part of the kingdom of heaven. We become residents of heaven instantly. We live in the world, but now our home is somewhere else where temporary residents in this place before we go to live eternally in the kingdom of heaven. So when you and I give our heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, while we live in the world, this is not home. We are foreigners, we are temporary residents, and as some translations put it, we're aliens. And so, but that doesn't mean that we don't have to connect with people in the world or of the world. It doesn't mean that we don't communicate with people of the world because the real reason that we're here, the reason that God leaves us here is to be his representative here so that others might know to be able to make the home the kingdom of heaven. That's our job. That's our purpose. That's what God has given us so that we can can take the message of hope into a world that is so anti-God, but to give people a glimmer and a glimpse of what it is to be part of the kingdom of heaven. That's where we have the responsibility to take what is seen from our perspective as really good news, and it is good news. It's great news. It's wonderful news. We have good news that this world is not as good as it gets. Praise God for that. This world is not the end. This is not where life finishes. We're all going to sit at the front of a church or in front of a building somewhere in a box, as my grandchildren call it. And you know, we know what we're talking about. We're all going to end up there someday. No one wants to talk about it. No one wants to acknowledge it. No one wants to think that that's me lying there, but we will. And then we'll be cremated or then we'll be put into the ground and buried over. And, you know, have you ever thought about what that looks like in five years' time? Because the body perishes. The body was never meant to last eternally. The body was never meant to do that. In fact, we're told that we, this body, Paul describes this body as a tent, and a tent, a temporary place of residence. What's the, what, is it housing? What is the tent holding? Our soul. The body will die, but the soul does not. And it's the soul that you, that is the real you, the I'm looking at you people, and and I don't see you online, but I know you're there, but I'm looking at you, and I recognise your soul because of your good looks. Why are you laughing? Are you thinking you're not good looking? But we recognise our soul because of the body that God has given us. So if your body was taken away, you could still be sitting there and I wouldn't know. So God gave us a body so that we would recognise our soul, recognise the real you. And the real you comes out in the things that we do, the things that we say, the life that we live, the the attitudes that we hold on to. And so as we grow in faith, as we learn to have this rock-solid faith in Jesus Christ, we're, we're going to be growing in accordance to be like Christ. Christ-like behaviour, we call that. And so we we have this responsibility to be God's ambassadors here on this planet, to take this good news of people around the place. But there's a lot of us, though, who are not comfortable about sharing our faith with all of this culture. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Many are not comfortable because we don't want to lose friendships. We, we know that my stance on, on certain things is going to, you know, oh, that's, you're a bit weird. And, and friendships are broken, particularly 
when we're young, especially when we're young, when God's word comes into our life, when we make the decision, the, the threat of losing friendships and peer groups is strong. But we're told in James, James 4 actually says, James 4, 4 says, if we like that, if, we, if we're going to be tainted by that and we're going to not do what we're told to do because of these friendships, he says, you're adulterers, don't you realise that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? And so we, we can't manage to do that. He said, I say it again, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. And so it's, it's impossible for us to have this friendship and, and a, a light allegiance with the world, but also an allegiance with the kingdom of heaven. There has to be this, this separation, and that's what's so hard. That's why it's difficult, because we have a lot of good friends here, we have a lot of good mates, and we have all these relationships here, but if we go here, do I have to give them up? Absolutely, some ways, yes, but in other ways, no, because we live in the world still and our job is to lead our friends and help our friends and guide those people into the same joy of knowing the kingdom of heaven is theirs as well. And so while ever we, we want to make you know, ourselves aligned with the world, we're going to be in trouble with our spiritual faith unless, unless our faith is rock solid. If we are weak, if we're not coping with you know, all of this stuff that's going on and we start aligning ourselves with the world, it won't be long before we become like the world and we'll conform ourselves to the patterns of the world that we're told in Romans 12 not to. We want to fit in. And others don't feel like or, or enjoy or feel comfortable sharing their faith because we don't know what to say. How You know, I'm, I'm just me. I, I've not got any wise words to say. I know what's happened to me, but don't ask me to tell anyone else about Jesus Christ because what do I say? What, and what do I say if they don't want it? What, if I, what do I do when, when they, they ridicule me because of that? And we worry about saying the wrong thing or, or not having the right answers to these things, these questions that potentially could come up. And, and we don't want to get into an argument with people because I like these people and that's going to divide the relationship again. But And Paul tells us then in Corinthians, he says, but we're, we're God's ambassadors and God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. We speak for Christ when we, we ask people to come into the kingdom of heaven. That means that it's, it's not our words that's doing this, it's God is giving us everything that we need in order to plead for those people that we love and appreciate and want into this same relationship that we've been able to enjoy, that God speaks through us and we speak on his behalf. So what we do, though, rather than speaking about Jesus Christ, we, we tend to surround ourselves with like-minded people who don't like talking about Jesus, who don't want to, to go out of their way or to take those risks of stepping out. We, we surround ourselves with those and we become an inward-looking group of people if we're not careful. We don't want or we, we are reluctant to speak openly about our faith in case something happens. We hide our faith and we try and fit in with the rest of the world and so that they don't ask us these difficult questions because I have no clue on what to answer. And that's a significant problem considering the, the commission that Jesus gave to the church to go into the world and make disciples. 
That's a, a really significant problem if the only commission that we have in this world is to go in to make the, into the world and make disciples if we're unwilling to go into the world and make disciples. Doesn't make a lot of sense. And I, and I understand that statistically around 70% of Christians say that they've really never shared their faith openly with anybody. That's a significant number of people. And what's also significant is that about 30% of non-churched people would say that someone has had the opportunity to share with them. 30% of those outside the church have had someone share with them. 70% of people in the church haven't done it. That means that there's about 70% on average of our, of our community who have never heard the gospel message, who have never fully understood what it means to have faith in Jesus Christ. Oh, they might have heard about it. They might have read some stuff about it, but they've never had anyone come to them and say, you know what? You need the Lord Jesus Christ. Come back to him. And what's also interesting is that statistically, again, I know statistics are, can be manipulated in ways, but statistically they are saying about if you ask people, about seven out of ten people who are asked are willing to at least attend a church if asked. But they've never come because they've never been asked. That should alarm us a little bit as a group of people who we know in Matthew 28, Jesus said to go into the world and make disciples. That's an indictment on the church whose mandate it is to go and make disciples. So this morning we're picking up our reading from Romans 5. We're in Romans 5 at the moment. We're going to start from Romans 12, uh, 5 verse 12. But Paul in this part of the letter gives us a very detailed explanation of the predicament that we're in in life, in this culture, and also the solution of how we can get through it, which should be good news to all of us, and it is good news for those who are able to understand and receive it, particularly those outside the body of Christ. So Romans 5, verse 12, it says, When Adam sinned, sin entered, sorry, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Yes, people sinned even before the law was given. But it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. Still, everyone died. From the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not disobey an explicit commandment of God as Adam did. Now, Adam is a symbol of a representation of Christ who was yet to come. Let's pause it right there. We have, if you're taking notes, the first note is, or the first point is the problem. Fill it in if you want to. But we have a problem. What Paul is outlining here is sin entered into the world through Adam. What Adam did led to sin entering into this place. Even though there was no law to break at that point in time, sin was still present. So it wasn't about keeping the law because sin was still present. And Paul outlines the problem that we have in verse 12 when he reminds us of this Genesis account of Adam. And what we read in Genesis is then in the beginning, God created a world absolutely perfectly in every way. He placed man, the perfect man, in the Garden of Eden. He formed the woman from Adam and gave them the authority over everything. He, he gave them everything they needed, the food, the, the water, the, the plants and animals are all there for them. They were to enjoy what God had given them. 
But in the course of time, not very much time, Satan interrupted the peace and convinced Eve that she should eat some of the fruit that God said, you know what, you can eat anything of the garden, but that tree in the middle, you shouldn't really eat. You shouldn't eat that. Don't eat that. If you eat that, you're going to die. Now, you can ask questions. It's not today's not the right day to answer them all. Why would God do that? And all those sorts of things. There are some very good reasons why he needed to do that. But that was the, that was the only thing they couldn't do realistically was eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil that was planted in the middle of the garden. But, he, but Satan convinced him that it was good. He convinced them somehow that it's okay. God's really not that bad. He doesn't, he doesn't want to eat that because he's holding out on you. He doesn't want you to be all knowledgeable and have all this wisdom. If you eat that fruit, Satan says, you're going to become like God. You'll know good from evil. And the scriptures tell us that Eve looked and she saw that the fruit was good and she tasted some of it and she gave some of it to her husband who incidentally was standing right beside her who didn't speak up and it was his job to look after her but he didn't say anything. Us men always stand up for our wives. What's going on with Adam? But interesting, it tells us very plainly that it wasn't Eve that was held accountable for that. It says in verse 12, when Adam sinned, when Adam sinned, sin entered into the world. What about Eve? Did sin enter in through Eve? Well, apparently the scriptures are very clear that it says when Adam sinned, sin entered into the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone. So don't go blaming Eve. For where we are, why didn't Adam speak up? Everyone sinned because of Adam's sin. What happened at that point is the problem that we've got is that right there when we, we come to, to speak to those outside of the body of Christ, when we speak to those who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, that, that they are believing this, the lie that our society has sold us, that convincing us that sin didn't enter into the world, but rather we are evolving from nothing and we are getting better and better as time goes on. We're getting so smart and so intelligent that this moral problem of sinfulness, it, it wasn't there in the beginning. Sorry, it was there. It's always been part of the problem. We're going to manipulate it and just we're just getting better and better we're moving away from this sinful behavior rather than what the scriptures tell us we're moving into it deeper and deeper and deeper now think about that there's nothing wrong with our world morally isn't there you would have to be blind to not see the moral degradation of society that's happening even non-church people say things like, oh, I wish for the good old days. Why? Because there was no sin in the old days. Yes, there was, but it wasn't so blatantly obvious. It's getting worse. It's getting harder. It's getting more difficult to live in the culture that we're living because we're getting in this down, we're in, caught up in this downward spiral of sinfulness and we're getting worse, not better. But society has sold us this lie that we're getting better, we're getting more intelligent. And it might be true that technology may be improving, but the moral value of our society is certainly decreasing. And it's completely what the scriptures tell us will happen. When God gives us over to our own evil desires, the, the depravity of society will end up in a pit. Romans 1, we've already worked through that. 
So one of the first things that we need to do when we're talking to people about the gospel, when we're talking about people coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ, is somehow convince them or to to get them to understand that they have a problem. I don't have a problem. So how do we convince it or how do we share or help them understand that, that they have a problem because Satan's a really, 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 really good liar. And he's convinced everyone, even us at times, about things that, that, are, that are bad, but he's convinced them that they're good. He said, it's okay to do that. And we've got, oh, I like that. I like how far I can push the boundary because if I can push it just that far and not just step over it, I'll be okay. But that's Satan. God says, don't even go near the boundary. Here's the boundary, but it's not there to look over. It's there to stay away from. And Satan's this great liar and his lies have been confused and, and, and believed right throughout history to the point where many of those who are heading for a Christless eternity don't even know that that's happening. We don't even realise that if, if I was to die today, if I was to end up in this coffin at the front of a building today, then it, I, I can't, I don't know what's going to happen that I would head for this Christless eternity that the Bible calls hell. In fact, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And here's the problem that we all need to face is that we're all sinners. Romans 3.23, we've dealt with that. We're all sinners. We've all fallen short of God's glorious standard. We've all messed up. There's no one who is righteous, no one who deserves to be in the kingdom of heaven. And we've sinned by the fact that we have all descended from Adam. It's not about being a good person or a bad person. We have all descended from Adam and Eve, so therefore sin is in us. We're not sinners because we've done anything wrong. We're sinners because it's in us. It's our nature. We're born in that pl- into that condition. And when Adam sinned, it tells us sin entered into the whole world and sin became part of our whole nature of humankind. We're all sinners. We've all fallen short of God's glorious standard. And the issue with that is that if our sinful nature, that sin nature that we all inherit If it's not dealt with, that will keep us out of the kingdom of heaven because a sinful nature or sin cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. That sin nature that we all have is going to keep us out of the kingdom of heaven. That's not good news. That's the problem. So it doesn't matter how many good things we do trying to make up for all the bad things that we've done. It doesn't matter how many good things that you think you can do and say you're a good person. It's not about doing good things. Doing good stuff doesn't make sure that we get into the kingdom of heaven. Unless we deal with the sin nature that we all have, we are going to head for a crisis eternity. That's why it's not what we do that determines who we are. It's who we are that determines what we do. It, it's, it's not earning our way into the kingdom of heaven by doing good stuff. It's because we're already going, we're part of the kingdom, that we will do good things. And that's the problem that every one of us must face. But I can't just be a good person. I just can't do the right things and think that God's going to overlook it because I still have the nature. I still have that sin nature. The scriptures call it in various translations the old man. We either face it now, today, if we haven't already, we, we face it in this life or we face the consequences of not dealing with it when our body dies. That's the two choices that every single one of us have. The consequence of sin is an eternity in hell 
with no chance or no way of getting out. For it, I don't know how, how to explain eternity. It's a very long time. If, if you were to draw an, an imaginary line from where you're sitting, out the door, out the window, and if this was a flat earth, which of course it is, if we were to flat earth and we were to imagine a point as far as you could see and draw this imaginary line on there and then you were to take your pen or your pencil and you were to go on the dot, on the line, somewhere, the width of that dot might illustrate somehow the length of your life on this planet. The rest is a very long time. And, and I don't think we get that. We think, oh, well, you know, I'll just have a party. It's a very long time. And the problem is that the consequence of sin is an eternity in the kingdom in in hell and Matthew 13 tells us the angels will throw them into a fiery furnace those who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth and whether we like it or not whether we believe it or not whether we agree with it or not it's there and the the reality is that hell wasn't made for people God didn't design or or create hell for us. So why did he create it? He created it because, because Satan rebelled and it was for Satan and his demons. That's the purpose of hell. It was to, it was to cast Satan out at the right time into the pits of hell. That's his eternal home. But if we align ourselves with the world, if we agree with what Satan wants us to do, if we we conform ourselves to the pattern of this world, we are aligning ourselves with him. That's why there will be people who end up in that situation. That's why they'll be thrown along with Satan in the demons into the fiery lake of burning sulfur and tormented forever. Revelation 20.10 says the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulphur, joining the beast and the false prophet, and there there they will be tormented day and night for a short period of time. doesn't say that. It says forever, and that's the ultimate consequence. That's the problem we've got. So there is a solution, which is point two, the solution, because God just didn't walk away from Adam when Adam sinned. He didn't say, oh, sucks to be you, Adam. And you could ask, why did he not just, poof, get rid of Adam and Eve right there and, and because it, was, it would have been simpler to get rid of two people at that point than to annihilate a whole group of people later. But here's the point. John 3 gives us a clue. John 3, 16, God loved them so much. If, if God were to take Adam and Eve out of the, the world that they had messed up at that point in time and he had created you and I, because we would have done the right thing, we would have messed it up just the same way. So where does God stop? Oh, well, I might as well give up on mankind. But he can't because he loves you. He loves us. He wants us to be in this relationship with him. He wants us to understand what it is to trust him. So God didn't write us off. Romans 5.15, pick it up from there. It says, there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam brought death to many, but even greater, even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through the other man, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the answer. He's the one that we have forgiveness through. It's God's grace that we have Jesus Christ given to us and we can have the forgiveness of our sin and the result of God's gracious gift is that is very different from the result of that one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's free gift leads to being made right with God. The word that we use there is righteous. 
We can be righteous because of what Jesus did for us. Even though we're guilty, we can still be we can be blameless through Jesus Christ. Even though we're guilty of many sins, for the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness for all who receive it. All, all who receive it will live in triumph over sin. Not just the smart people, not just the intelligent, educated people, not just those who haven't sinned badly, if there is such a thing, all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. All have sinned, but all have been forgiven if we receive Jesus Christ into our lives. It's free. It's a gift. And while sin entered the world, uh, sorry, when Adam brought sin into our world, Jesus Christ took the sin back or he paid the price of what Adam did. And so our sin nature, while we are born with that, it can be dealt with when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, when we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, when we turn our lives to him and say, Lord, I'm heading for a crisis eternity. I don't want to be there. I want you come in my life and lead me and show me how I can live my life so I don't have to go through all that nonsense. The only way to deal with what man did, what Adam did, is to receive Jesus Christ. Because through the one man Adam, sin entered the world. Through the one man Jesus Christ, sin was dealt with. That's why Jesus came. That's the purpose of him being here. And it wasn't just the death of anyone that needed to be dealt. The, the wages of sin is death, we're told. The wages, the payment for this sin is death. That's where we're heading. But what happens when Jesus pays the price? Because in the Old Testament, the Old Testament process was that if you bring this pure lamb or this pure presentable animal, there was a number of things you could bring, but if you, it had to be without blemish. It had to be the perfect sacrifice. If you brought that, God would accept that as payment for the sin of the nation or the individual. And what Jesus did was in coming to sacrifice himself, mankind couldn't present themselves because we're blemished. We have the sin nature. We, we can't die for our own sins because we're all, we're the sinner, we're the problem. Well, we can't pay the price for our sin. We will if we don't deal with it, but we couldn't deal with it for all mankind. And so when God sent Jesus Christ, the pure man, lamb sacrifice, so that all who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ without blemish, and the writer of Hebrews puts it well when he says the old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of what was good to, was to come. Not the good things in themselves. It's the sacrifice, I'm sorry, the sacrifice under that system, they were repeated over and over again. They repeated again and again, year after year, and they were never able to provide the perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. They had to, each time they come, <coughs> excuse me, present themselves and, and present this, this sacrifice. If they could, <coughs> if they could have provided a perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped. That's important for us to understand. If they could have provided the perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped. For the worshippers would have been purified once for all time and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. But instead, those sacrifices actually only reminded them of their sinfulness year after year, for it's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. It's not possible. 
So the old, under the old system, it just reminded them of how bad they were. And then in, in further down in Hebrews 10 verse 8, it says, First, Christ said, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings or bird offerings or other offerings for sin, nor were you pleased with them, though they were required by the law of Moses. Then he said, look, I've come to do your will. He cancelled the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. The old covenant of sacrificial lamb was, was cancelled so that the new covenant through Jesus Christ could be put into effect. For God's will was that for all of us to be made holy, all of us to be made holy by the sacrifice of what Jesus Christ, the perfect lamb, did once and for all time. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Then he sat down in the place of honour at God's right hand and there he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. And for, by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who were being made holy. Praise God for that. Once and for all. That's why we don't have to bring a sacrificial lamb every time we come because it's been done once and for all time. Being once for all time, it means that Jesus has given us the, the way in which we can have forgiveness and know that we are not guilt, going to feel the guilt or experience the guilt because he takes the blame. We still have done things wrong. We're still guilty of our sin, but the blame has been taken away. We can be blameless in his sight. And Hebrews 10 verse 18 says, when sins have been forgiven, there's no need to offer any more sacrifices. We don't have to come and continue to, oh, I'm a, I'm a wicked person. Because through Jesus Christ, we've been saved. Everything that needed to be done has been done. Romans 5, we read it before, but 16, 17, God's free gift leads to our being made right with him even though we're guilty of many sins. And even though there was nothing wrong with the actual fruit that Adam was told not to eat, it wasn't like it was poisoned. It wasn't that it was bad. It wasn't that it was, it was disgusting to look at. It wasn't the fruit itself. It, the problem was that they disobeyed God. That was where the sin nature, it was this willing disobedience of a known law of God. It was the willingness to disobey God even though I knew that wasn't what I'm supposed to do. That's what, that's what brought sin in. It wasn't the fruit per se. It was they weren't supposed to eat the fruit. And it's the attitude of the heart that we need to deal with today. It's the attitude of the heart that we have to say, you know what, I can just do this and God's going to forgive me. I can. It doesn't matter. It's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask permission, right? And so this whole attitude is that we can do what we can do and God's going to forgive me. It doesn't matter. It does matter. The heart matters. It's, it's the attitude of the heart. That's, that's, that matters for us, that God needs us to be correcting. It's the attitude of the heart that he wants us to have shifted. It was Adam and Eve that they, did, that they didn't trust in God's word. And that was the problem. Maybe they thought God was going to just overlook it for somehow or he wouldn't find out. But he did and he does. And he's provided a way out for us. He still loves us. He loves you so much that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life with him, regardless of the fact that we've been born with a sin nature. It can be dealt with. Even though we're still guilty, we've been made right with God. Even though we've messed up, we've become righteous. 
And even in our righteousness, we can, we're still guilty. We're still messed up. But God has, it's His righteousness imposed or put upon us because we, our righteousness is not good enough. We, our own way of dealing with it isn't enough. It's God's righteousness. If we confess our sins and God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all of that unrighteousness and put his righteousness upon us so that we can enter into the kingdom of heaven free, his children, his people, And God has given us that. We're blameless and righteous when we receive the good news of Jesus Christ. We receive that and we're born again. As Romans 5 tells us, it summarises our problem in verse 21. It says, just as sin ruled over the people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules over us instead, giving us the right to stand before God, resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ. Praise God. There's the answer. There's the solution. It's through Jesus Christ. We can enter into the kingdom of heaven, even though we were born with a sin nature. He deals with the sin nature and gives us, we are a new creation. We're brand new people. The power of sin is dealt with. So how, how do we bring this all to conclusion, which is the third point, the conclusion for those that are following along we, what we do with this newfound life, we'll, we're going to rush through this a little bit, but verse 18 to 20 gives us a clue. Adam's one sin brings condemnation for any, everyone. That's where we read it. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were, but as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant, which led to a discussion about, oh, well, I'll just have to sin more and more and get more of God's grace, but we'll deal with that. When we accept Jesus Christ into our life, we have been given this brand new nature, our old sinful nature has been dealt with. It's done away with. We become a new creation, a child of God, a a part of the kingdom of heaven, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that exactly. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old is gone A new life has begun. If you have given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ in recent times, you are a brand new baby in Christ. Praise God. That's wonderful news. Rejoice in the fact that you are a child of the King. If you've given your heart to the Lord in the past, you are still a child of the King. You should be more mature, but you are still a child of the King. And so we become this brand new person. We move into a new relationship with God as our, not just this way of being who's out there dictating what we can and can't do. He's our father. He loves me. He loves you. The old is taken away. He gives us a brand new life. We become spiritual infants under him to be nurtured and cared for. We need to have the comfort and nurture of each other. In the process of this, we need each other for more than that reason, but that reason. We need to have the comfort of others who are mindful of our needs and and like-minded to train us up and to equip us so that we can be firm and mature and confident believers of the Lord Jesus Christ so that our faith will be strong, so strong that when the things of this world come against us, we'll be able to go ploughing on through and say, you know what, greater is he who's in me than who he is in this world. Far be it for anyone to derail me from where I'm going because God is faithful. I want people around me that will strengthen me, not tear me down, divide me apart and pull me out of stuff. I want people around me to teach me, to equip me, to help me, and I want to have that attitude for myself. And as we grow, we take on this responsibility, or we should, I don't know whether we all do, but we we need to take on this responsibility of discipling other people. 
because that's our job. We're to make disciples, go into the world and make disciples. That's the commission. Our responsibility is to come to Christ, receive Christ, to grow and mature in Christ and go and teach others what we've learned. That's the the purpose of your life and why you're still here. And if you're breathing, which most of you are, that's our job. The problem is, and we've spoken about this in past weeks, is that that doesn't take away all the problems and the difficulties of life, does it? In fact, sometimes adds to them because Satan is the key to that. Satan will not giving, be giving up on you because you, oh, that's a child of God. I'm going to stay away from them. No. In fact, they're a child of God. Let's pull them back. Let's make it harder. Let's get life, make life more difficult. He's going to work you, work harder at, at getting you to fail. And Revelation 14, 12 says that means that this means that God's holy people, those who receive the Lord Jesus Christ in their life because we've been made holy, his holy people must endure persecution patiently, obeying his commands and retaining or maintaining their faith in Christ Jesus. So we're told that we've got to endure this. And while all this is happening and not lose sight of the fact that we do what we know to be right despite what others might say, maintaining our faith and going about letting others know about their demise because that's what the problem is because they don't know that they're heading for a crisis eternity. If they fail to recognise salvation or recognise their need of salvation, that's the good news. That's what Jesus Christ has given us. We we don't have to do anything to be set free from the power of sin and free from this bondage that we are in, even though we might not realise we're in it, except to ask Jesus to take control of our life, to come into our life, because he's paid the price. And 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, and all this is a gift of God, a free gift. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to work for it. Who brought us back to himself through Jesus Christ and God has given us the task, here's the task, of reconciling people, others, to him. That's our task. It's a free gift and we've been given the task of taking this good news of Jesus Christ into our community. Maintaining the spiritual gifts and, and, and things that we need to have. So let me just ask you a couple of questions really quickly. Have you received this free gift of eternal life? Have you accepted Jesus Christ into your, law, into your life as, as your Lord and Saviour and, and ensured your, your place in the kingdom of heaven? Because that's the first step. And if you haven't, today is the day of salvation. And I invite you to do that. If you've already done that, my next question would be, who are you discipling? Who is the one person or three people or whatever? Who is it that you are discipling today? Who are those you are praying for and actively doing things to ensure that they don't end up in the crisis eternity? It doesn't really matter how old we are. It doesn't matter how young we are. We, we have a responsibility to be Christ's ambassadors, to go into our world and share the gospel, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ and disciple them and to, to live our own lives in a way that's going to be in accordance with those scriptures. So there, there's, that's the two questions. Have you received it? Then please do. If you have Who are you discipling? And if you aren't, look for that opportunity because that's how we grow. If you want to mature yourself quickly, start discipling other people quickly because they'll ask you difficult questions. And you know what you do with difficult questions? Go and see the pastor. No. You start, you you can come and ask the pastor, but I'll be saying you go and work it out and, and help them. But I might even give you an answer, but you're going to deal with it. That's how we grow. That's how we learn. That's how we mature. Start teaching things like Sunday school or helping out with ministries. Get involved in where you're having to do those things. 
One of the best places that you can learn as a new Christian is in places like Sunday school. It really is. Learn the stories. Hear what God's doing. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your kingdom. I thank you for what Jesus has done for us, that we might have eternal life through him, but you've given us to us as a free gift. May your kingdom come today, Father. May this this kingdom be extended in Yapoon and and this area, Father, for those who are a part of this community. Give us the confidence to stand up for you, the confidence to go into our world and make disciples, the confidence to to seek after your righteousness and not live in in a mentality of our own righteousness, to check the attitude of our heart this morning. And if it's hardened in any manner, Father, I pray that you would bring conviction upon us that we might soften our hearts toward you. Discipline us, Father, where we're needed. Teach us peace and gentleness and self-control. Teach us to have joy in the midst of persecution. Encourage us to stand up for truth and justice and righteousness. Help us to be faithful to the calling to which you have called us so we might be good, true ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ, to take the message of hope, the good news of the gospel, into a world that is heading for a crisis eternity. Father, I pray that your kingdom will come and your will done in this place today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.